to follow some COVID, uh, COVID procedure here. I see the 20 feet apart, <laughs> uh, 20, 30 feet apart. So let's assume that it's um, COVID sickness. So, all right, very good. Welcome. Uh, let's start. And uh, Father in heaven, Lord, thank you so much for your love and your mercies. I pray that you may be with us as we start this class and that uh, we may be able to learn about your creation in jesus name amen. amen all right well you've been around now for a little bit and uh you know me a little bit at least know who i am if you're here my name is adner abreu and um, i was born and raised in the dominican republic uh back in 2009 when i was 16 years old i came to eden valley for six months, worked in the summer there for six months, and um, and then I came back again um, and worked on it six months in 2010. And then um, just back in 2007, when I was 14, I enrolled in, um, in a bamboo school, in a bamboo art uh, school. So basically learning how to do furniture buildings. And that was actually my first introduction to um, to greenhouse structures. So we were, I, I remember we were building some greenhouses out of bamboo. We did a lot of gazebos and pavilions and things like that. Um, and uh, I spent there two years, every day for two years. It was just from Monday to Friday. Um, and that taught me, uh, quite a lot about um, trades and skills and things like that, measurements. Um, and as well, when I came to Eden Valley in 2009, then I saw how greenhouse actually works because before then I was just the builder of the greenhouses. I didn't know how to work inside of the greenhouses. And, <clears throat> and then here, after I spent 2009 and 2000. Uh, 10 summers here at Eden Valley. Then I went in 2011 and built my own greenhouse. So that's when kind of my agricultural journey started. Um, now, before then, growing up, uh, my, my mom and my aunt, till this day, uh, really, we love orchids. And we grew a lot of orchids. Our backyard was just full of orchids. And I used to go and mow the lawn for my grandmother and she would give me some money and I would go and buy an orchid. And so basically that's kind of my love for nature and agriculture was from a very young age. But um, in 2012, I came back here and that's when I really learned um, how, how to do more of a machinery um, as well. So be between 2010 and 2000. 12, when I was coming here, the farm manager taught me, uh, my eyes were open to a more of a structure, systematic, um, more advanced gardening, right? Because back in Dominican, you know, pickaxe and, 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 and the hoeing and all these things, that was, that was, that was, those are the main tools. And um, let me make sure this thing, it's, it's on. Uh, no, it's not on. And so, um, so, so very good. Now it's on. Um, so basically, when I <clears throat> when I was here in 2012, the farm manager then said, "Hey, I'm going to watch the hills, and um, and that's where I'm going to be going next." And I said, "Oh, you know, okay." So then later on in the summer, I was asking him, so are you still going down to watch the hills down in Arkansas? And he said, no, I'm not going, but you should go and study there. And I'm like, what? <laughs> First of all, that was a big challenge for me because I didn't know much English. And the only English experience, like English speaking experience that I had was my summers here at Eden Valley, which was just in the farm, 2009, 10, and 12, and that's it. So... Um, but I said, well, Lord, if you want me to study, um, please open the door for me. So I, I called and, and they said, send out an application. I did. I asked my friend here from the farm. I said, I need help <laughs> to, to fill out the application because I don't know how to write English. 
I mean, in, in English. And um, so he helped me to fill out the application. I sent my application. Uh, and in 2000, so forward into 2013, um, the Watch the Hills called me and said, hey, we need help in our farm here. Our farm manager isn't doing too well. And then he, um, then, then I went to, to, to watch that for, for three months. And that's where I worked on the farm and as well, they kind of got to know me. And that's when, because they had to apply for a R1 visa, which is a religious visa. So before you apply to someone for that, you kind of, you kind of need to know them, <laughs> you know, who they are. So, so after my, I didn't know my work there. Uh, in 2013, I, uh, they, they applied and I went there to, um, and, and then I enrolled as a theology major in 2014, January, 2014, I started. And, and of course that's, you know, that's just, that was just a whole journey there of studying, canvassing, reading a lot of books, learning how to write and read as I'm taking college classes. And, uh, but with discipline and commitment, I mean, really you can achieve anything. So, uh, it just takes a little more work. Okay. When, um, I remember, you know, taking Hebrew and, and my, and I had to spend twice, twice as much of time trying to figure out the Hebrew language and the English language as I'm learning the Hebrew language. So, um, but nonetheless, uh, five, Fast forward to my end of my time there as a student, they offered me the farm manager uh, position, and I I took the position. I was a, their farm manager for their farm manager for three years. Now during my summers between college, you know, between the co the years, the I mean between the school year, I worked in their farm as well. I never went canvassing like uh, my wife and all my classmates. So, and three years afterwards, I came here. To, to Eden Valley to start an agricultural leadership program. And um, that's when I came in 2021 to Eden Valley. Um, at the end of that year, the farm manager left. So that's when they asked me to be the farm manager here at Eden Valley. And, um, and then last year, we decided to, to do the program, the, the training program. And that's where the medical mission, uh, the agricultural leadership program started. So. So just a little bit of what I've done, where I come from. And um, so that way, you know, who is Adner? You, you can tell him a little bit more. <laughs> so any questions or comments? So very good. All right. So when I was at, when I was at um, Watch the Hills, the farm manager there, uh, before I became the farm manager, uh, the guy there was an 86, 88 year old, um, World War II veteran. And he really taught me a lot. He was very organized in the shop, in the farm. He was very structural. Um, you know, till this day, I can tell you where the soap, you know, where the, uh, bottle of soap was for you to wash your hands at the end of the work. Everything was in its place. Uh, it has areas. The shop was very organized. And another thing that he really taught all the students there and everybody that worked around him, it was to really use what Alan White called the thinker, right? So, and you've heard uh, in grad, um, the quote I read, and that's kind of where I'm going to start as well, because it is very foundational for any trade and for life and, and mainly applies greatly in agriculture, so I'm going to read the quote, and it's just a challenge to, to, really, to really start thinking uh, more deeply uh, about things and about what you're doing, especially when it comes to gardening. Um, and of course, this is the quote I read uh, during grad, if you were there. It says, every human being created in the image of God is endowed with a power akin to that of the creator, individuality, power to think and to do. The men in whom this power is developed are the men who bear responsibilities, who are leaders in enterprise, and who influence character. It is the work of true education to develop this power, to train the youth, to be thinkers, and now may reflectors of others' men's thought. It is interesting that in this day and age, pretty much 
you tell everybody and they say, oh, I'll do it. Just tell me what to do. Okay. Um, you know, you come to this room and we're going to have classes and it's a mess. And, you, you know, it's like if you tell me to organize the chairs, I can do it. But out of the uh, out of out of your own initiative, sometimes that really doesn't happen. And that's kind of the generation that we have right now in society. And it's interesting that the men who who um, to, uh, that, that are thinkers and not men reflectors of others men thoughts are what we are known as Jeff Bezos and and founder of Apple and you know all these you know Elon Musk like all these people they're on their own train if you hear them if you hear their interview they're on their own train they don't care about Instagram they don't care about anything else they don't care what's happening around the world they don't care about anything they're on their own train okay so and that's why you see them. I mean, I, uh, among 300 million people in the United States, you notice them. So what is God calling us to do as Christians? Are we ought to be noticed as Christ's ambassadors? Yes. And that's why he says you have to be thinkers and not mere reflectors of others men's thought. Because once you start thinking like others or just the same or use your own or you use your individuality, then you just become, you just become part of the line that is walking down the aisle. And so this is the main idea. Now, how does they apply? How does this apply to the um, gardening? How does this apply to farming? Um, so, for example, you have these plants right here. These two tomato plants. They're very obvious that one is doing really well and that one is not doing too well. But the reality is, I have seen people excited about these plants. You know, I've seen them. It's like ah. My tomato is it's not doing too well, but I'm, I'm excited about it. It's big, it's beautiful, it's green, but there's no tomato there. Like, it's supposed to be a tomato plant, you know? And then, for, 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 for example, which soil is better, this one or this one? The one on the right? Yeah, so, and it's just because, now, I haven't talked to you about, I haven't talked to you about the benefit of rocks in the soil, so you're telling me that this is better? <laughs> you see, so there is a what is called common sense, a common sense built up that everybody knows that we haven't talked about soil. Yeah, you're telling me this soil is better. So, and the reason why in gardening and farming in particular, because what happens is with gardening, the gardening, it doesn't forgive. Gardening does not forgive. So if you don't do it right, it's just not going to work out. So... And, and a lot of people, they don't use that common sense. They don't have that in them. But if you follow things, if you follow what people call, if you follow your gut, if you follow common sense, then you will do just a lot better without even knowing much of gardening. So this is basically the idea that, that, that you think it through, that you start thinking. And of course, these are very obvious um, examples here. So... Um, any any questions on that? Any any thought on on this quote here um, from Alan White Education, page seventeen? Art. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, very good. All right. So, so I was just wanting to to touch on that and. Um, but now we're moving into, and what I'm going to do in, the, in this class and the following and the remainder two, two classes that we have left is that I want to give you some basic principles, some parameters, some foundations that will help you understand um, gardening. And even without knowing much of the details for you to be then successful. Does that make sense? So... Basically, what I would like to give you, it's kind of like this, this lens, you know, that you can look through and, and understand how a garden works and what are the steps, what are the walls, what are the walls that really make a garden successful, 
because I can tell you, we can go into details on how to plant lettuce and all these things, but you can Google that and it will, you can YouTube it. What you will be fine to find on YouTube is that these outside principles that help you be successful in growing lettuce. See, we'll see what I'm saying? Because what happens is, is that there's all these ideas and, and, and you can go, I mean, you can go to YouTube and, and find it right there, but yet you're still not doing well on, on your ladder. So that's why I want to, I want to focus on, on this thing. So we won't go, um, Let's see how much we have on this. But planting schedule and soil preparation. So we're going to be talking about planting schedule. Now, when it comes to gardening, this is perhaps the most value piece of material that you will have in your farm. But in fact, this is your guide. So basically, why is planting schedule important? On time is key for gardening. So this idea of timing is so important. And you see it actually in the Bible. So if you go to the Bible, it says that, you know, Paul says, when the fullness of time has come, God sent forth his, you know, uh, God forth sent his son, born of a woman, I forgot the text now, but pretty much emphasizing the fullness of time. So throughout the Bible, this idea of time and the fullness of time and the completion of time is very clearly throughout the Bible. Now, another thing that is clear in relation to time, it's gardening. And, and the seasons. So um, Jesus is getting in on the, on, on, you know, after the, the elders and the Pharisees, he's getting after them because he says, don't you know that right when the fig is, uh, is, is turning, you know, this is happening, that summer's around the corner. So why is it that you don't know the signs of the son of men, right? So basically this idea, it's like, the idea of learning how to read the, the times, the seasons, comes from a long time ago. The thing is, is that in today's age, what everybody wants us to believe is global warming. So if it's too cold, it's global warming. If it's too hot, it's global warming. If it's nice temperature, it's global warming because it should be hot at this time of the year. If it's, you know, everything, 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 it's like, and it's, and, it's, and it's so in us now that, that we don't think about it. But the, but the reality is that there are patterns in weather. There are patterns in certain things. But the thing is, we're not taught to, to, to read any of that, you know, to read this science, to, to understand how weather patterns work. So this year, for example, in, in Colorado, it was a wet spring. Next year, it's going to be a dry spring. And uh, everybody that has lived here long enough, you have a year that has a lot of apples and another year that have no apples. And, and basically, that's the basic idea. One, one winter is quite wet and the other one isn't. And apples require a lot of um, moisture. And the weather patterns that comes with a lot of rain is different than when it's dry as spring. So... Um, so basically this idea of understanding the weather and as well being on time for planting. Now, let me put it to, let, let me give you a couple of examples here, um, for the tomatoes. Um, why, why on time is key. When I was farming down in Arkansas, um, you had about three weeks. You have about three weeks of harvest. Okay? Harvest. Three weeks. Why, why three weeks down in the south, down in Arkansas, in this area, you have this much? Because what happens is, is that if your tomatoes... If your tomato is starting to produce right here, so if this was your harvest time, it got too hot. So the flowers were not going to set fruit. You see what I'm saying here? Okay. 
And then, if you started, if this was your harvest time, right here, that means your plant was not going to make it here because it was too early in the season. That was already, it was too cold for the plants to grow. So basically, if you were wanting to be successful at gardening tomatoes, for example, in that area in the south, you have to be on time in planting those seeds to land in this three weeks gap that you had. So does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so. Different areas. Right, so we're right, and we're gonna go through there. Yeah, we're gonna go through 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 that. But this is the main idea. Now let's come to Colorado. Right, we're here, and if you notice, a lot of tomatoes were green when the first frost came. Right, so let's say, and we did harvest some, but if fifty over fifty percent of the tomatoes were were green. Because tomatoes, Colorado in this area, our growing season is very short. You know, we have a very short growing season, which means is that I need to put them as soon as possible outside, which I'll tell you how you determine that. But then um, you need to be done by a certain time. So you're very, you know, cramped. You're, 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 you're very tight by time. And and many people, even locals, tell tells me, I don't know how you guys grow everything that you guys grow. Because even people around here can't grow what we grow. And the only difference is, is being on time. Because one week in gardening makes a huge difference. You think that six days don't matter? In gardening it does, and it does big time. And so... So why planting schedule is important? Because this idea of on time, where you are and where you're going, this gives you direction in terms of what, you're, what you can do, what can you plant. And um, this is, you know, the planting schedule here at Eden Valley um, has been developed throughout the years. And, and that's, you know, that, that kind of what, what tells me, that's, that's my guide you know, here on this farm. That's what tells me when to plant all the, you know, those, those specific dates. And of course, it gives you an idea of how much you need to plant. Another thing is that the planting schedule has is that the quantities that you need to plant. So if you're going to produce for your family, you can't plant 30 heads of lettuce when it's just two of you. Another thing is that happens a lot in gardening is that people have a lot of lettuce or zucchini, for example, you know, a lot of zucchini for two, three weeks or four weeks, and then they don't have, they have none. So how you can, how can you have successive planting and how you can avoid gaps in your planting? Now, I will give you an example of what happened to me last year with tomatoes. If um, last year we run out of tomatoes for two weeks in the summer, how many, how much? Two weeks. We had no tomatoes. Now, we planted our tomatoes. Our first planting was February 15. The second one was March 15. The third planting was April 29. Now, What's the problem here? So the two weeks that I didn't have tomatoes for in the summer is right here, right here. So this year we had tomato throughout because what happens is, is that we figure that our greenhouse tomatoes produce a very strong supply of tomatoes for one month. Yes, they come back, but they have a dip, okay? So what, what we do is that we have our first planting, goes like this, has this peak, and then goes down. But our second planting goes like this, has this peak, and goes down. Our third planting, if well calculated, then you will have a peak right, right here, and then it goes down. You see what I'm doing here? Can you see that? So with... 
with the month of April, planting in the 29th, we had a two weeks gap here between the peaks, right? So then, because what we want to achieve and the way we have tomatoes all the time at all times is because we have created this plateau up here to have a great deal of tomatoes throughout the season. Um, well, I plan it was it was like in July because these tomatoes wow. there, yeah. But but meaning you don't. And I was wondering how how can I fix this? And I just looked at my planting schedule and then I adjusted this. And so I put April fifteen. Now, April twenty nine is the day for tomatoes to be planted outside. So. What I did this year is that I planted, yes, 15, but I did one in the 29th as well. Since I had more greenhouses, I was able to plant the, the 15, the 15, the 15 of April, and the 29th of April. And that was four plantings right there. You had a question? So the April 29th, that's when we're from Colorado. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, let's go into... Hold on, let me not get ahead of my slides, cause okay, let's let's go to what uh, uh the, the the example. How you determine dates, right? Is this making sense so far? Okay. So you have two main concepts when it comes to planting schedule and basically two main dates that you need to find and that is your first uh i'm sorry your last um frost and your first All right, so this is the dividing time. Now let's say, give me a date in the spring, any day. March 25th. March 25th. March 25th. All right, Esther, give me a date in the, in the fall. September 30. Okay. Now, this is just a made up, right? <laughs> First frost and last frost. I hope that's obvious. <laughs> okay. So then we have varieties that are cold loving plants and others that are heat loving plants. Okay. And that's when you go into the details. Here's the details are important. But tomatoes, do they like cold or hot weather? Yeah. After the first frost, do tomatoes die? The plants? If you put a tomato plant in your refrigerator, in your, in your, in your freezer, will they die? Yeah. So what about if you put them in your refrigerator? They will, they will barely survive. <laughs> yeah. So basically what I'm trying to say is that tomatoes, for example, in our example here, they're heat loving plants that are like the cold. So when do we need to plant them? Before the last frost or the first, la or after the first last frost? I mean, after the last frost. After the last frost. So which means is that on, on um, April, after March 26, we need to plant our tomatoes. So let's say that we're going to give it a few days after the last frost. So we'll say we'll do March. Um, we're going to do March 30th right here. That's when we plant our tomatoes. Now, it's interesting that um, now this is where we're going to plant our plants. So in the seedlings... A tomato lasts only four weeks. So we need to backtrack. Now, this is if you have your greenhouses. 
or indoor growing, of course. And then you go four weeks, which is what? Um, you plant, you're heating for March 30, you go for, for a week back, that's what? Basically March 1. Yeah. So March 1, it's your planting date for your tomatoes outside in this given area. The plant, yeah. So when I mean planting day, that is seed to soil. Whether it's seedlings or whether it's direct into the fields. So you're saying that March 1, you plant your seedlings? March 1, yeah. The seedlings, yes. Yeah. So that's why we're here. Right, so but I said March 30th, my plants. So if I want my plants ready, because this is when we're free of frost after March 25, which means is that we need to go back four weeks, which is the amount of time that tomato plants are in seedlings, and backtrack four weeks, which comes to March 1. And then March 1, you plant your seeds, and you transplant March 30th. Yeah. Um, so they're not even affected by the fall seasons by March 30th transfer. Correct. Yeah. So we're okay. So on the first, where are you planting them? Are you planting them? So this is if you have. So to answer that question, March one. That's why I said if you have, for example, if you had uh, in greenhouse a heated greenhouse or indoor planting, a lot of people have like a little rack with lights in their basement or in the kitchen and things like that, and they start early. Or, in your case, if you don't want to deal with any of that, which, you know, I have done that myself, I just go to a nursery and buy my tomato plants. So I go to my nursery, but buy tomato plants around this time, around March 20-something, and go buy my tomato plants. You can actually buy them earlier if you want, like a week earlier put it inside your house and let it acclimate there. And then, the, but it's very important not to put your tomatoes after your last frost day. Now, one point about the last frost day, it is very, it's, if you mention this, a lot of people will be debating you, all right? Because, oh, it's, how can you know that the weather changes all the time? The last frost day, what that means is the average historical average, right? And the historical average of frost dates. And they choose the date that after that date, it has never frosted after that point. So which what it means is this. This is another thing what it means. Our planting schedule here at Eden Valley was, was made back in the two, early 2000s. And it says that May 22nd is the last frost date. Last year, in the month of May, we had a snowstorm that dropped four inches of snow, May 21. See? Now May 23rd, May 21. And, and after that, we didn't have a frost. Now, did we have temperatures in the 80s or upper 70s in the, in the, in the month of May? Yes, we did. But... If you looked at your weather and said, man, it's looking so nice out here, according to my weather, um, it, it, there's no frost, indication of frost 15 days in ahead or 10 days, whatever it is, I'm going to put my tomato plants. Don't do that because you have a 90.9%, 99.9% of losing your tomato plants. Or at least they may not die, but they're going to struggle throughout the summer. Yes. try to gauge off by the consecutive amount of days, per se, as far as okay, after that frost date, you know, you never know what the weather's going to do. So, like, what, at least a week, and then hit it number one? So, yeah, so, you know, you just Google. You Google your last frost date, and it will give it to you on that zip code. Now, for the next three years, you're going to watch that frost date. 
very closely because what happens is is that sometimes we get frost here but loveland doesn't get frost like the frost day in fort collins is it's it's like 10 days almost 15 days off then right up here yeah that's in three years is where you're going to to is 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 the trial for this frost day in your house at your house because your house has a microclimate. Like Eden Valley, it's in a microclimate, a big time microclimate. Sometimes you drive here and 27 is wet. A, a rain came and, and it's wet. Sometimes it's wet here and not there. Sometimes, uh, I don't know if you saw rain that came to, to right there to the uh, um, Bobcat um, Ridge and it rained there, but it doesn't rain here. Sometimes right through Windsor, uh, not Windsor, um, Bertha area down there, it rains, but not here. So you have to understand that those microclimates. So, microclimate? yes. So because you have your average, you know, your, your weather, Loveland weather, but you have your weather here where you are. And that has a lot of variance. Yeah. Could you just clarify and make sure I Yeah, yeah, of course. So March the 1st. This is when you actually plant the seeds. Yes. Are you planting them in those little plastic containers? Or are you planting them in a greenhouse? So you're planting them. This is seedlings. So yes, in the in the little plastic container, you can use. There's several methods. You, there's some people use blocks, plastic containers, biodegradable containers. Basically, it's just those little transplanting pots. So they're called transplanting. Yes. Or or seeds, yeah. And then four weeks later, yes. Because you're paying attention to your last frost date, which we said is March 25th. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna wait roughly three to five days, right? Later, and then I'm actually gonna transplant the mm -hmm. seedlings that I planted on March the first outside. Outside, correct. That's 100 correct. Now let's say that you want to plant pumpkins. And pumpkins or in, or cucumbers, for example, they don't do seedlings. You're not doing seedlings with them, and they like the heat. When do you plant those? What day? Yep. And you're not doing seedlings. No, no, they they like the heat. Remember. Between September 30 and March, and March 25 is cold. So we're getting into the summer. Correct. So pumpkins, things that you're planting directly and they're heat loving plants, your squash, your cucumbers, your melons, all these things. Then on March 30th or even March 25th, you will be down there punching seeds in the soil. that long for a pumpkin. Pumpkins normally come up now, right? This time of year. Right. So when did you actually plant your pumpkins? May 22nd. And they just came up when? The other day. I mean, you guys, uh, it, 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 takes, uh, it takes over 100 days. Yeah, the winter squash. And winter squash, it's ideal for the first frost to go over them, a light frost. It locks in. It kind of, it kind of tell them, hey, you better finish, finish up sucking all your nutrients because you're going dead soon. So they're trying to strengthen those seeds, and that's so. After that first frost, they're like, yeah, we better get our act together, and then that's when you go and harvest them. Yeah. Yeah, so for example, so if you see pumpkins in the middle of the summer in any store, it came from a warmer state. So, or from another country. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, why this, and this is why, um, uh, Shir Shirley? Uh, huh? Jack, sorry, remind me your name. Jacqueline. Jacqueline. 
Um, so, so Jacqueline, one of one of the things here is that um, this date was determined by this by this date, right? So, and then basically, what determines this whole thing is the first is the last frost date. So wherever you are, wherever in any state, you find your average last frost day and the first frost day, and then that's how you figure it out. Now, let's say you're in another country that doesn't have frost date. What other countries have that is similar to frost dates but are not frost dates? Other countries? Other countries don't have frost, but they have other things, one thing in particular that is very determining. And it comes every, just, just like frost dates. Uh, okay, <laughs> you're close, hurricane seasons, okay. When hurricane season comes. Oh, yeah, you know what causes hurricanes? Uh-huh, and what else? Storms. Okay, what causes storms? <laughs> Yeah. As the as the as as up here we're warming up, and down there they're cooling down, right. and, and that's how the moisture f comes up about, and and then you have hurricanes. Yeah. So so basically, what? Well, come on. There's this one thing about other countries. You've been in another country. Who who's been in another country? Okay, humidity. What causes humidity? So you have rainy seasons and dry seasons. Yes. Really? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So in other countries, you don't have first frost, last frost, none of this stuff, but you do have rainy seasons. In rainy seasons, are there, for, for, for most countries, okay, it's actually the warm weather. And dry season is the cold weather. Yeah. So that's that's why. So for example, I was down in Paraguay, and the guy uh, there was planting garlic, and and the garlic was very small. They struggled to grow the garlic, and I said, okay, tell me which is your coldest month. And they told me, oh, it's um, I think he said it was July or something, because you know they're they're in the southern tip down there. And I said, okay, well, plant plant your, and I, and, and then I asked him. When, when is the first month that starts to get cooled here? And he said, oh, it's um, sometime in, in April. And I said, all right, in April, you're going to start planting your garlic. And he had an amazing harvest of garlic. I've never planted there, had no idea about, had no idea about garlic, what variety he used, didn't know what kind of soil he had. None of that stuff. But these concepts of time are key to the success of any garden. Any questions? If we had, um, if we were in our own areas and we planted, and we had a rainy season, mm -hmm. what is that going to do to our crops? Yeah, it's going to flood them. <laughs> I mean, will they grow eventually? So, for example, um, in rainy season, like in the tropics, rain, in, in some tropics, like Caribbean tropics, right? Rainy seasons, it's either in the spring, it's oh, actually most of the time it's in the spring. And so, and it is, and, and we're kind of up here in the northern hemisphere and, you know, portion. So bas basically it's you, you have winter, you know, the December, all these things. So for example, if you're in a tropical area in the Caribbean, you will be planting broccoli, for example, of cabbage comes now. Like this is prime time to plant all your cabbage, all your broccoli, all this all kale, um, um, onions, garlic, everything that loves that cold. You want to take them through there. Okay. So now another thing is, is that like people in Africa, they do is that they prep the soil. All right, they prep the soil 
during at the end of the dry season. They plant their seeds and then they wait for the for the rainy season to kick on. Then the rain season comes, plants stuff grows. And uh, I don't know if you've seen a, a, a movie or a documentary. It's been a long time, so I don't know what which one of the two are. But it's kind of like a miracle, like a potato miracle in Africa or somewhere, somewhere in the world. <laughs> um, but but basically, is that these people that planted potatoes and never rained, and they actually harvested a bunch of potatoes, and the potato never came up. It was just all down there. It was like a miracle thing. It was like a ministry. So, anyways, I've 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 even forgot the name of the movie, but I know it, I know it exists, and I heard somebody talk about it the other day. But so, uh, potato miracle or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. Right. So, uh, a field. It's one, it's a, it's, a, it's a patch of anything, of one thing. So a field doesn't have a multiple things. It has mainly one or two things. So if I, if I say the word a cornfield, what comes to mind? A cornfield in Iowa, right? Like, I mean, or out here in Loveland, like a huge amount, like several hundred acres of corn. If I tell you I have, if I tell you I have a garden, I have corn in my garden, how many plants do you think I have? <laughs> you know, in my garden, it's like five plants, you know? Yeah, so, so, so basically that's, that's the main idea. Field crops, um, they're planted in larger quantities. Um, so in your area where you have your garden, um, where you have your garden, then you will um, you will have two spots, your garden, your grow boxes, and then a little area where you put things like pumpkins, watermelon, that they just require more space, and that's kind of like a field. Yeah. And so, well, we'll take a break here, and then um, then we'll, we'll go into that slide that is more about the design, the layout of the planting schedule. So you can be able to to figure that out. So we'll be back. It's 10 a.m. We'll be back at 10.10.